My father, a true beneficiary of Fordism, who entered into a standard employment relationship in the 1950s, is turning 90 this year. Next to indoor flush toilets, he thinks computers are the best technological advance of the 20th century. However, early this month, he posted a protest on Facebook calling for a boycott of automated self-service checkouts in grocery stores. At a Fudge family dinner two weeks ago, he told me he couldn't see where the substitution of machines for people is going to end. Over dessert, my sister rec recounted to me how in the software company she works in southern Ontario, a large proportion of the customer service work has been offshore to Pune, India. She also told me that the local workers who were fired were selected because they were the most costly, senior and skilled, although they provided the best customer service, the most complex assistance, and did so the fastest. These vignettes reflect what the popular and academic press, international institutions, and policy actors identify as the two critical influences on the future of work, technology and globalization. My father's concern about a workless future reflects the views of Martin Ford, who in the rise of robots, technology, and the threat of a jobless future predicts that the impact of new technology, artificial intelligence, machine learning, five gig processing speed, and big data will have a devastating impact on jobs. Cyber physical systems connectivity, which heralds the fourth industrial revolution, will enable computers to do skilled jobs provide for self-deriving automobiles and trucks, and allow robots to do the low-wage jobs in fast food and retail. People will lose their jobs, wages will continue to stagnate, labor share of the national income will continue to decline, labor markets will become ever more polarized, and recoveries will not result in more employment. According to Ford, education and training simply won't work, the only solution is a universal basic income. My father might seem somewhat reassured if he were to read the World Bank's 2018 flagship World Development Report called The Changing Nature of Work. The report traces fears over the disruptive impacts of technology on workers' livelihoods back to 1589, when Queen Elizabeth I expressed concerns over the introduction of knitting machines. The World Bank claims that the anxiety of people living in advanced countries, advanced economies, that technology fuels increasing inequality, the gig economy, and a race to the bottom are unfounded. According to it, while manufacturing jobs in the advanced economies will either be automated or relocated to the developing world, technology opens up new markets and creates new opportunities. The World Bank does acknowledge that workers will be displaced, value chains will be dispersed globally, remote work via platforms will increase, and that jobs will be broken into tasks so that employees will no longer be employees, but taskers. It also admits something that Guy Standing identified almost 20 years ago. Instead of seeing a convergence towards a standard employment relationship of advanced economies in developing countries, we are witnessing a convergence in the opposite direction, an increasing proportion of jobs in advanced economies that are characteristic of the informal sector, short-term, temporary, insecure, and outside of social protection. According to the World Bank, quote, changes in the nature of work caused by technology shift the pattern of demanding workers' benefits from employers to directly demanding welfare benefits from the state. These changes raise questions about the ongoing relevance of current labor laws, end quote. The World Bank sees it as the state's responsibility to manage the dislocations caused by changing skills and new business models that accompany the new technology. 
The new social contract will involve investing in human capital, strengthening social protection, and mobilizing revenue through taxing platforms and formalizing the informal sector. Employers bear no obligations in this new social contract. In fact, true to form, the World Bank argues that labor regulation should not attempt to protect jobs, decrying labor law in the developing world as a colonial transplantation. It claims that social protection, which provides a universal minimum rather than employment-based, is a better fit for the developing world. Central to both the pessimistic and optimistic visions of the impact of technology on the future of work is a consideration of a shift from employment as a way of dealing with labor market risks, such as low income or insecure employment, to some form of universal social protection. At its most ambitious, the call is for a universal basic income, a term that denotes policies that embody three design features. They are not targeted, they are not conditional, and the assistant takes the form of cash transfers, not services. Although the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development does not endorse a basic, universal basic income because it's too costly, it advocates shifting protection from the employment relationship by, for example, granting individual entitlements based on residency criteria or for means-tested benefits on needs in order to prevent coverage gaps. This focus on the impact of technology on the future of work is understandable. It's tangible. We see it every day in grocery stores when we check out, when we buy goods that are manufactured in China through Amazon or at Walmart, when we take an Uber, or when we talk to someone at a call center located across the globe. It is an easy culprit to blame for the anxieties that people have over the future of work. However, the process of technological change is complex, nonlinear, and costly at the same time as jobs are destroyed New products, industries, organizational routines, and business models are created. The diffusion of these innovations through the economy will be uneven and will involve experimentation with new institutional and social arrangements to sustain livelihoods. The impact of technology on the future of work is a political question, which raises questions about insecure livelihoods, insufficient employment, and inequality both within and between nations. What makes people in high-income countries anxious is that the post-war social contract based on standard employment is unraveling. By contrast, the greater number of people in the least developed countries, most of which are former colonies, never enjoyed this social contract in the first place. But focusing on technology as the cause of the disruption is to confuse the most visible manifestation of how certain kinds of changes are implemented with the underlying driver or dynamic of the change. What has changed is, in fact, much more profound. Accumulation has shifted from monopoly or managed capitalism to globalized and financial capitalism. Ignoring the extent to which financialization has changed the basic terrain and calling for a new social contract is as much magical thinking as the belief that it will be possible to fund a progressive universal basic income without large increases in tax revenues or that we can sort out climate change without first confronting our carbon addiction. Unlike the World Bank, in establishing its global commission on the future of work, the International Labour Organization recognized that financialization was a megatrend that would influence work. But financialization is more than a megatrend. An increasingly autonomous realm of global finance has altered the underlying logics of the industrial economy 
and the inner workings of democratic society. Financialization is the accumulation regime that has succeeded Fordism. In the 1970s in the US, profit generation from production shifted to interest, dividends, and capital gains. Financialization and globalization are intertwined. Faced with increased international competition and domestic demands for shareholder return, American manufacturers have offshore production and control global supply chains to cut down costs. Neoliberal policies that deregulated the financial markets further facilitated and promoted financialization. Productivity gains are not reinvested in the corporation, but instead are distributed to shareholders or used to purchase financial products. The income of ranchers has come at the expense of wage earners. Increased income inequality and high levels of household debt have simultaneously increased the systemic risk in financialized capitalism. At the meso level, financialization refers to shareholder value approach of the corporation. Corporate restructuring to promote shareholder value and most strikingly, manager's income result in job loss, wage and benefit rollbacks and intensified work. Although the rise of financial elites and the strength of the ranchier and managerial classes, classes are critical to understanding the shareholder value strategy, the mechanisms by which it is disseminated and transmitted are complicated and extend to the state and to wage earners. The switch from pay-as-you-go state pension systems to funded pension schemes and the provision of tax benefits for individual investment in mutual funds encourage citizen earners to invest in financial markets and actively promotes the financialization of everyday life. The significance of the change under financialization can only be fully appreciated once we understand that capitalism is what Nancy Fraser called a total social institution rather than simply an economic system. What Fraser does so well is to link capitalism to the external conditions of its existence, social reproduction, the Earth's ecology, and political power. Capitalism is marked by the institutional separation of economic production from social reproduction, nature from human productive activity, and political power from the economy. Under capitalism, the great bulk of care, work, and planning that goes into the daily and generational reproduction of human and social life largely takes place beyond the market, in the family, community, and public institution. Capitalism also assumes a sharp division between a natural realm, conceived of as offering free, unproduced supply of raw material that is available for appropriation, <coughs> and an economic realm conceived of as a sphere of value produced by and for human beings. Capitalism also depends on public powers to establish and reinforce the rules of the system. Without a legal framework underpinning market capitalism, it is inconceivable. Law and politics operate in their own sphere, the public realm, accountable to different institutions with different rules from that of the economy. In the public sphere, democracy and equality arguably rule, while in the private realm, what you own is all that matters. These public powers have mostly been lodged in territorial states, including those that operated as colonial powers. The legal systems of imperial states established the contours of seemingly depoliticized arenas in which private actors could pursue their economic interests, free from overt political interference. Territorial states also mobilize legitimate force to put down resistance to the expropriations through which capital property relations were originated and sustained. Capitalism's drive for accumulation is insatiable. Fraser's conception of the crisis as between capitalism and the conditions of it, its existence is critical. Schumpeter regarded creative destruction as the process of industrial mutation that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within. 
incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating a new one. However, contra Schumpeter, the crisis is no longer simply internal to capitalism. Globalized and financialized capitalism undermines the social, ecological, and political conditions needed to sustain it. Instead of focusing on the crisis of social reproduction, the diminishing wage and the care deficit, or the environmental crisis exemplified by climate change, I want to conclude by focusing on the political crisis, which is the simultaneous hollowing out of democracy and the rise of nationalist and racist populism. We need to confront this political problem before we can think of regulating for a better future at work. States today have diminishing capacity to mediate between the rights of citizens and the requirements of capital accumulation. Pressures to reduce direct taxation and the role of credit rating agencies in relation to sovereign debt have systematically constrained the capacity of states to implement policies that promote social welfare and social solidarity. In order to prevent a banking crisis, states have socialized losses, translating private debt into public or sovereign debt, and embarked on austerity policies that alienate and immiserate their citizens. With policies of privatization and deregulation, democratic states have ceded their ability to control the quality, price, and distribution of public services. The upshot is, unsurprisingly, that citizens are increasingly disaffected from democratic politics. Post-democratic political apathy combines with populism and nationalism, which is tied up with ideas of white and European supremacy. The, the election of the coalition Avenir Quebec, a right-wing anti-immigrant populist party earlier this month, shows that Canada and Quebec are not immune from the wave of nationalist and racist populism that swept Trump into power, fueled the Brexit vote, and resulted in the election of right-wing anti-immigrant nationalist parties in Central Europe, such as Hungary, and in the heartland of Europe, Italy. Bolsonaro's rise in Brazil suggests that this turn to authoritarian populism is not limited to, to the global north. These right-wing nationalist and populist political configurations have been successful in channeling working class voters' discontent over the declining economic status towards scapegoating immigrants and other vulnerable populations that distracts from the deepening capitalist austerity being implemented. They also blame globalization, especially as exemplified in trade agreements for the problem, and once again reify the nation as the key site of social belonging. However, it is neither possible nor desirable to return to my father's Fortis time, which although it provided a good male breadwinner wage and social protection, was based on women's subordination in the household, racist immigration policies, and an international regime that expropriated rents from the former colonies. How then do we respond to the challenges global financialization thrusts upon us? Class matters, so it is absolutely imperative to address economic inequality and to understand the anger of those who feel that they have lost their previously secure economic status. But class is not the only basis of struggle. Class is lived by people through a range of status hierarchies that naturalize and legitimate subordination. Take the racialized other who is considered to be the le legitimate subject of exploitation. It is absolutely critical to link subordinated status identities to economic precarity. Nor can we retreat back to the sanctity and security of the nation state, for it depends upon an international system that is profoundly unequal. Moreover, we need global regulation if we were to stop an environmental crisis and address the task of developing a humane 
governance regime for human mobility. Multilateral arrangements beyond the nation state are critical, but they need to be accountable to people and not to capital. Globalization requires multilateral regulation, and the international agencies necessary for such regulation need elements of democracy. Now, these are very abstract claims, most of which are worked through much better by many of you in the audience. The conference will provide a feast of papers and panels on the political economy of care work, how to respond to disruptive technologies, developing social protection at the European Union level, globalizing norms and practices in multinational companies, regulating transnational and national value chains, and cultivating democratic collective voice at work from the local to transnational levels. The richness of the offerings is impressive. I would like to thank the conference organizers on both the scientific and technical sides for bringing us together, and I look forward to spending the next three days learning how to meet the challenge of designing institutions needed to support sustainable and decent work for people around the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>